Do you love me? You imbecile. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I am Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode 9 of House of the Dragon. Guys, we went really deep into this one, and we're going to explain all of the character parallels to classic Game of Thrones and why this episode shows us why the dragons died out and why the Targaryen dynasty fell. So, let's get to it. First of all, we have not talked about how the opening titles have been changing the past few episodes. Like we discussed before, the opening titles show the Targaryen bloodlines flowing through a model of old Valyria, because Valyrian and blood runs through their veins. So each sigil on this opening represents a person from House Targaryen or one of the houses they married into. A couple episodes ago, a Daemon sigil was introduced in the shape of the helmet that he wore at the heir's tourney in episode one. Now, Lena's sigil was flooded after this happened. Dracarys! But her sigil still flows into his twin girls, Bela and Reyna. Just as the classic Game of Thrones credits showed us what parts of Westeros we were going to see, these opening credits feature characters that we're going to see in the episode. So, Damon, Rhaenyra, and their children don't show up in this episode's credits, at least not prominently. Right here, we can see the sigil of Viserys being covered in blood after his death. And in the background here, we see Rhaenyra, because she is in the background of this story. She is someone who is referenced, but never seen. A big new change is Viserys' blood flowing into Allison's sigil, but then we see the four bloodlines representing Allison's children. Helena is the insect because she has an affinity for bugs. Aegon has what I think is a female figure because I'm guessing he likes to whore around. Aemond is a sapphire because in the book he replaces his missing eye with a sapphire. Who's the fourth kid? Actually, you know what? I'm not sure. Let me Google it real quick. Oh, no. No, no, no! Oh, God! Oh, there's some kind of virus on my phone now. Stupid free Wi-Fi. Look, I'll look that up in a little bit. Oh, wait, I remember. The fourth kid is Dayron, and he lives in Old Town. Aegon and Helena both flow into their twins, Jaehaerys and Jahera, and their third kid, Maelor. Now, the camera quickly moves past Rhaenyra's sigil, which is the Valerian steel necklace that Daemon gave her. And speaking of Daemon, I think this is him here, because the next blood flows are the two kids that he has with Rhaenyra, Aegon the Younger, and Viserys. And then we get into the actual episode, which is really a giant game of where's Aegon? We begin the episode with a solitary piano note underscoring shots of an empty King's Landing. Now the single piano notes are haunting because the instrument is all alone and it makes the music feel empty, kind of like the place that we're looking at. We start on a shot of the empty Iron Throne to emphasize the point of this episode. The king is dead and this empty chair needs to be filled. Now if you want to go very deep into foreshadowing, this is also reminiscent of the last day this throne ever existed. We also see this empty courtyard, and if that courtyard looks familiar, it's because Circe will one day create her war map of Westeros in this same courtyard. Now, I remember this courtyard because it's a location that shows the progress of the Green Council's takeover of King's Landing. The small council chamber room is also empty, with Chekhov's attendance balls in the middle of the table. Now, later, this room is ground zero for greedy people who use the King's death as an opportunity to seize power for the good of the realm. So, what we've seen in this show is that the kingdom has slowly been eaten away from the inside. Viserys thought that he could trust people like Otto, but in fact, they've actually been threatening the kingdom like supposedly free Wi-Fi. Now do right now? Well, Doug, earlier I downloaded a virus on my phone because I logged onto a Wi-Fi network called free Wi-Fi. But we don't have a Wi-Fi. Yeah, I know that now. It turns out that the Wi-Fi was being run by some middleman as a way to steal data from my phone. It turns out this happens all the time in public places like coffee shops. Then how were you or who to trust. Well, Doug, I highly recommend NordVPN. They're the sponsor of this video. NordVPN has a new feature called Threat Protection that actually protects you from malicious sites, downloads, trackers, and intrusive ads. So like, let's say you click on some suspicious attachment accidentally. Threat Protection actually deletes that attachment before the download finishes, protecting your desktop from getting infected. Now it's actually the only ad blocker that I use. But NordVPN does not just protect your devices, it can also save you money every single month. Oh, how? Well, have you ever noticed that there are a ton of movies and shows that are just hard to find on streaming? Like, you have to subscribe to 10 streaming services and then none of them have the one movie that you're looking for? Yeah, I know that feeling, buddy. Right? Well, see, just about any movie you can think of is streaming on Netflix, but maybe not in the United States. So, you can change your computer's IP address to another country with NordVPN. Then, it's easy to watch a Spider-Man movie on Netflix via another country where it is actually streaming. It's like adding free streaming sites on top of the ones that you're already paying for. So if you go to nordvpn.com slash screencrush or click our link in the description, 
you get a huge discount on a two-year plan and get four months for free. Now, the free months are only available through YouTube, so click our link and get your computer protected today. Back to the Easter eggs. Now, in past episodes, these balls have been used to give subtle hints about who is a green and who is a black, like Allison's ball is green. You keep saying that. What is a green and what is a black? It all just looks like different shades of gray to me. Yeah, yeah, the book actually makes a bigger deal out of this. So the blacks are people at court who side with Rhaenyra because the traditional Targaryen colors are red and black. But the greens are the people at court who side with Alicent because remember, she wore a green dress to Rhaenyra's wedding feast. And green is the color the High Towers use to call their banners to war. Although in the book, it's a little different. Alicent wears the green dress to a party celebrating her five-year anniversary with Viserys. Now, normally, a woman would wear the colors of her husband's house, so this was seen as her assorting the authority of High Towers over the court of King's Landing. Now, for instance, a little later we see Jasper Wilde, the Master of Laws, wearing dark green. But back to the empty council chamber. The window here is left open, implying that one of the seven gods, the stranger who represents death, was allowed in to claim the life of Viserys. We also see the stairs where Rhaenyra was forced to endure a several minute tracking shot moments after giving birth. And then the score switches to light piano chords following by a thud of doom. literally underscoring that something ominous is building up in King's Landing. And then a boy crosses the future map of the courtyard, and on these stairs he walks by a dragon torch. And we never saw these in Game of Thrones because Robert Baratheon would have ordered them all removed kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. This boy is more than likely one of Viserys' servants who discovered his body, and he tells the news to Allison's handmaiden Talia, who we first saw here. Talia, not now. And now we've seen that she is an informant for Damon's former mistress, Missaria, aka the Queen of Whispers, aka the White Worm. Now we're gonna talk a lot more about her in a bit. When Alicent hears about Viserys, it breaks her. She genuinely came to love the man, but not only that, she actually cared for him as his body disintegrated. Now they don't talk about this in the show, but she was also a companion to Viserys' grandfather, King Jaehaerys, the old king from the prologue. So she watched that old man slowly die for years and now watched her husband go through the same experience. This was hard for her. Now the first person she tells is her dad, the Hands of the King. And we learn that she did indeed truly misinterpret Viserys' last words. He told me he wished for Egon to be king. Now, we know that's just not true. Viserys was higher than a cat's back on Milk of the Poppy and thought that he was talking to Rhaenyra about Aegon's prophecy. Now, maybe Alicent didn't realize he was tripping, or maybe she chose not to realize this, because if she interprets his words just so, then she can justify making her son king. Either way, Alicent is an idiot. She's a kind-hearted idiot, but a woman who has a lot of hang-ups that I'll talk about later on. But I do like this motivation that they've given her. In the book, Rhaenyra and Alicent are portrayed as, I guess, a little more powerful hungry, but in the show, we see that they genuinely believe that they are doing the right thing. Alicent wants to follow her husband's final wishes, and Rhaenyra wants to fulfill Aegon's prophecy. Otto doesn't really care if Aegon being crowned was Viserys' last wish, but he's really happy to take advantage of Alicent's naivete. So next, Talia lights candles in a window, probably a kind of code to Masaria. Next, we go to an event that the book calls the Green Council, and that's also the title of this episode. This is the meeting where the small council plots to steal Rhaenyra's crown. Now, we have the aforementioned Jasper Wilde, Master of Laws, Master of Ships, Tylan Lannister. He's probably Team Green because Rhaenyra spurned his douchey twin brother, Jason, a few episodes ago. This is why men wage war, because a woman would never be ready for the battle in time. And Tylan is also the ancestor of Tyrion Lannister from Classic Thrones. I drink and I know things. Now, Jason and Tyland are twins, and you'll notice that twins keep popping up in the series. Damon and Lena have twin girls. Helena and Aegon have twins as well, and a large part of the episode features twin brothers Eric with an A and Eric with an E, Cargyle. Now, I think twins keep popping up in this story because it is essentially about twin claims to the Iron Throne. So, we're seeing a recurring theme of two. The series prologue begins with two claims to the Iron Throne. There are two Aegons. Rhaenyra and Laenor lead double lives, and the Dance of the Dragon is splitting the realm in two. This is Grand Maester Alley, and finally we have the Master of Coin, Lyman Beesbury. He's the only member of the council on Rhaenyra's side, and notice he is wearing black. After Viserys' death is announced, Tylan Lannister drops this nefarious line. We may proceed now with the full assurance of his blessing on our long-laid plans. 
Again, the book makes it seem like Alicent led this charge, and here we see that this was actually all kept a secret from her. But then again, the book is written from the point of view of unreliable narrators. Otto then talks about the gold cloaks that they control. Now, the gold cloaks are the city watch, basically the police of King's Landing. You'll remember that Damon was the leader of the gold cloaks in the first episode. In fact, the gold cloaks they wear was actually his idea, and the men of the city watch are fiercely loyal to him. Otto is saying that Damon still has some friends among the local cops, and that they want to weed them out. The gold cloaks are also a lot rowdier than the King's Guard. They don't have to take vows of celibacy, they can be baseborn, and the pay is a lot less. Now, like I said, Lord Beesbury is the master of coin, and he must not be very good at his job because Thailand announces, The treasury is well in hand. The gold will be divided for safekeeping. So, to keep the treasury safe and away from Rhaenyra, Thailand has split it between four places. The Iron Bank in Bravos, the Vaults of Casterly Rock, Old Town, and King's Landing. And they did all of this without the knowledge of the Master of Coin. Thailand's title is Master of Ships, and this is probably why. Because he could secretly move this gold to all these different cities which are all on major ports. Now, in the book, no one really knows how Beesbury died. There are even accounts that he was sent to the dungeon and lived out his days there. But here, we see that he was actually killed by his work. I will have no thought! What you say? Kristen Cole killed Beesbury because he essentially accused Alicent of treason. And as we kind of see later on, he seems to have transferred his feelings for Rhaenyra to Alicent. Everything you feel for me is your queen. But this unrequited love is a much better fit for Sir Criston because it allows both him and Allison to have feelings for one another while remaining chaste and pure. And then Harold Westerling, commander of the King's Guard, draws against Sir Criston. And notice how Tywin just immediately gets the F out of the way between them. He's truly the ancestor of Tywin Lannister, the guy who always knows how to pick the best side and avoid danger. Westerling keeps his honor and refuses to be an assassin for Otto. He hands in his white cloak, and I have a suspicion that he will sneak off to join Rhaenyra. This is like another former member of the King's Guard who defected to the enemy, Barristan Selmy. I am a knight. I shall die a knight. Remember Westerling for later, because I got a theory about him. So, as they plot to take over the kingdom, Beesbury's blood starts to pool on the small council table. The opening credits focus on bloodlines, but the flip side of that is the blood spilled by the struggle to have power over those same bloodlines. They mention... Storm's End is of concern. We may not assume the loyalty of Lord Boris, but he has four daughters. So, Boris Baratheon is the current Lord of Storm's End. Most of the Baratheons are the same, kind of like Robert Baratheon in Classic Thrones. They're loud, stubborn, violent, and always up for a rowdy time. <laughs> So Boris is the son of Boromon, this guy who offered Rhaenys his favor in episode one. Boris is also the cousin of Rhaenys. Hey, I thought the Baratheons like hated the Targaryens, like Robert said. I'll kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. Oh, but it hasn't always been that way, Doug. In fact, during Aegon's conquest, the Baratheons at Storm's End were one of the first great houses to declare for Aegon. There's even a Targaryen in the Baratheon family tree who goes back to before Aegon, and that would be Arion Targaryen. After Robert's rebellion, this Targaryen lineage is how his allies justified Robert replacing a Targaryen king. So, they're right to be worried about the loyalties of House Baratheon. They're stubborn and they've already declared for Rhaenyra. They were also one of the few great houses to vote for Rhaenys to be queen at that great council from the prologue. So, they would actually have no problem with a woman like Rhaenyra being queen. Storm's End is also very close to King's Landing, which would give Rhaenyra a strategic location on the other side of King's Landing. So, the city would be trapped between Storm's End and her seat at Dragonstone. And we actually saw Storm's End a few episodes ago when Rhaenyra cut short her tour by a couple months because she had the hots for her uncle. Next, Allison goes to see her daughter Helena, who is basically spoiling this entire show for everyone. Helena seems to have the gift of green sight or prophecy, just like her great, great, great-grandfather Aegon the Conqueror. She predicted that Aemon would lose an eye to get a dragon. He'll have to close an eye. And she talked about these threads of green and black. Spoon of green, spoon of black, dragons which foreshadow the war against the Greens and the Blacks. She has another prophecy that's a major spoiler, so I won't say what it is, and here... There is a beast beneath the boards. She is predicting the end of the episode, when Rhaenys brings her dragon out from beneath the dragon pit. Now, there are a few other things that happen in the book that could also be referenced in this prophecy, but again, I don't want to spoil them. But book readers know, blood and cheese 
Am I right? She's making a needlepoint of her favorite animal, an insect. Now, it's common for noble ladies to fill their time with craft projects like this, and Sansa Stark was always very good at them. Fine work has always Her twins on the ground are playing with two dragons, foreshadowing the dance of the dragons that is yet to come. And these candle holders are shaped like the seven-pointed star of the seven gods. So then, the great hunt for Aegon II begins. In the book, there are different accounts of where he was. Septa Eustace, who was a green supporter, said that he was in the arms of a noblewoman, while most accounts say that he was up to activity that were far more depraved. Otto sends twin knights to the King's Guard, Sir Eric and Eric, to go find him. Alicent even confused them in the last episode. There it is, Sir Eric. You need to wait. I'm Eric, Your Grace. Of course. As you can see in this episode, the two of them are on the fence with their loyalties, and by the end of the episode, it seems like Sir Eric is definitely Team Black. He helps her niece escape the castle and has a personal disdain for Aegon. Meanwhile, Alicent is sending Kristen Cole and Aemon to find her son. Aegon must be found and he must be brought to me. Yeah, why is she and her dad looking for them separately? Because if Otto finds Aegon, then he will order the deaths of Rhaenyra and her children. But if Allison finds him, then she will ask Rhaenyra to surrender her crown peacefully. Neither of those are a good idea. Not one bit. Now, Aemond is going to be one of the most important characters in this series, and it's telling that he is a second son in a show that is being shaped by second sons. Whatever do you mean by that? Well, a second son does not inherit title or any lands, so they're always more ambitious, and thus they make for more interesting stories. A second son wants to disrupt the status quo. Otto is the second son who was goaded into action by his older brother. Damon is a second son who never had a place at court, so he became a warrior. We even see Damon like this with his two daughters. Reyna was born a few minutes later, but she is the daughter that Damon favors less because her egg won't even hatch. Now, until today, Aemond wasn't even second in line for the throne. He was eighth in line, but now we find out just how ambitious he is. Desire who trains with the sword, who rides the largest dragon in the world. Desire who should be I like how the show used this moment to not only show us what Aemond wants, but also to give him common ground with Kristen Cole. I know what it is to toil for what others are freely given. Remember, Kristen Cole is not really of noble blood, and he had to literally fight to earn a place on the King's Guard when Otto wanted to choose someone of a noble house. Kristen's lack of pedigree is also why Rhaenyra rejected his wedding proposal. It is my duty to marry a noble man from a great house. Meanwhile, Otto has ordered that Renice be locked up in her room. Now, this is a change from the book where she was still on Driftmark during the Green Council, but now she's in King's Landing because in the last episode, they were appealing the succession of her husband's seat. Now, they're holding Renice because they're not sure whose side she'll take. Last episode, she was blaming Rhaenyra for her son's death. Yet you did worse than that with Lainor but she was also wearing black. And this episode, she just resents being locked up and doesn't seem to have much of a dog in this fight. Excuse me? Sorry, I mean, doesn't have much of a teeth filed down child in this fight. That's better. Mm -hmm. The other thing about Renice is that remember, 20 years earlier, she had the better claim to the Iron Throne. The Iron Throne was yours by blood and by temperament. But her father, Jaehaerys, rather than name her heir, decided to let the male lords and scholars of Westeros decide the succession at the Great Council. Fourteen petitions were heard, but only two were taken seriously, Rhaenys and Viserys. It is said that the lords of Westeros voted 20 to 1 in Viserys' favor. So now, Otto is trying to secure the loyalty of the people who voted for Viserys. And he's trying to minimize the people who voted for Rhaenys. These are the people who wouldn't mind seeing a woman on the throne, so Otto sees them as potential allies for Rhaenyra. We see Otto drafting time tiny scrolls that he will send with ravens to all the great houses. Now, in the book, these include a raven to Dalton Greyjoy, aka the Red Kraken on Pike. He just assumes that Renice will declare for her niece, and her husband, the Sea Snake, commands the largest fleet in the kingdom. So, he wants to secure the ships of the Iron Fleet. Unlike Danny, he won't forget about them. Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. In the book, Rhaenyra gets the loyalty of most of the eastern lands, including the island of Evenfall. Now, this is the seat of House Tarth, as in Brienne of Tarth, and that place got a special mention in the last episode. The ravens came in from even for princes. Rhaenyra also won the support of the Starks, but the North is so far away that it probably won't matter much in the war. But we do see Otto testing the loyalties of various lords in this episode. Most of these lords are unnamed, but this guy who initially declines to break his vow is Lord Merriweather. Now, Merriweather's descendant will eventually be Hand of the King under Aerys Targaryen II, the Mad King. Aerys ends up banishing him and installing Tywin Lannister. And as we know, Tywin turned on Aerys and helped install Robert Baratheon as King in Robert's Rebellion. So, well done, Merryweather. Your house's greatest contribution to history is its absence. But there are other houses that uphold their vows. House Phil keeps its sworn oath to the princess. 
House Fell is located in the Stormlands, just north of Storm's End, and they have declared support for House Baratheon. Again, you can see how the Greens are going to have trouble winning the loyalty of the Baratheon House. And the bald guy here who pretends to bend the knee to Aegon is Lord Coswell. Remember, he was the first person to congratulate Rhaenyra on her child, and the only person to greet her upon her arrival last episode. He ends up being hanged in the same square where Cersei painted her map of the Seven Kingdoms. And here's another thing I don't think we've pointed out in the past about the Iron Throne Room. The columns feature relief sculptures, probably depicting Aegon's conquest. Robert would have had these columns remade. So in the original series, they're actually covered with carvings of vines. Meanwhile, Larys is trying to clamp down on the spy network of the White Worm. Laris is another second son, someone whose lack of title led him into cruelty and ambition. People like to call him the Littlefinger of the show, but I actually think this guy's way more devious than Littlefinger. He locks up servants he suspects of being spies, so they can't spread the word of Viserys' death. Now, in the books, the Green Council kept Viserys locked up in his room for nine days until they could not ignore the stink anymore. That's disgusting! So, to find Aegon, Aemon takes Kristen Cole to the Street of Silk, and they're wearing disguises, much like Daemon and Rhaenyra when they visited this exact same location in Episode 3. Kristen Cole says, Every woman is an image of the mother to be spoken of with reverence. Oh my god, Kristen Cole and Alicent were made for each other, man. They're both people who hide behind their religions to justify not taking what they actually want in life. And as we see later in the episode, Alicent is extremely sexually repressed, while Kristen Cole expresses his repression like this. Well, I have no Sit part to what you say. They find out that Aegon is way more depraved than they thought, and he has to get his jollies in other ways. And by the way, this madam here, she totally punched Aemon's V-card, right? How you grown? The twins discover the really twisted stuff that Aegon is into, boy fights. They sharpen the teeth of these kids and grow out their nails and make them fight like abused dogs. I haven't seen kids treated this badly since Peacemaker. <laughs> This truly shocks Sir Eric, and he uses the event to try to persuade his brother to switch sides. Sagon spends many a night in this place. Do you see now what he is? We even see a kid with bleach blonde hair, and it's implied that this is one of Aegon's bastards. So this SOB likes to breed his own sons and then enter them into these fights so he can bet on them. He's like a twisted combination of Joffrey and King Craster. That was the guy up north of the wall who married generations of his daughters in Classic Thrones. In fact, we do get several indications that Aegon will be another Joffrey. He relishes in praise, he's emotionally unstable, and he delights in being cruel. Also, the product of inbreeding. So, after several days or hours go by, they finally dispose of Viserys' body. The women wrapping him up are the Silent Sisters, an order of the church that follows the god the Stranger. They've taken vows of chastity and silence. Now, we saw the sisters in the last episode, wrapping up Vaemon's corpse, and they appeared all the way back in the Game of Thrones' very first pilot episode. One key thing to notice here is that Viserys' crown is placed on his body. Now, later, they're going to crown Aegon with the crown of Aegon the Conqueror. That crown was worn by his son, Maegor the Cruel, the worst, most evil king that Westeros ever had. Now, when Jaehaerys became king, he wanted to put that crown in storage and had a new one made, so that way he could symbolically put Maegor's cruelty behind him. Viserys' crown is actually the same one that was worn by his grandfather Jaehaerys. Now, in the book, a knight named Sir Stephlin Darklin steals this crown and takes it to Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, and here I think that role might be fulfilled by Harold Westerling, who walked away from the Kingsguard. I recognize no authority but the kings, and until there is one, I have no place here. One of the most important scenes in this episode is the exchange between Renice and Alicent, and it really cuts to the heart of these women who are driving the action in the show. Alicent finally speaks her truth. You should have been queen. And Alicent has been forced to accept that in Westeros, women can never have real agency. After all, she spent her entire life being the brood sow of a king. But she does say, We do not rule, but we may guide the men that do. Gently. Which, uh, never works out. Cersei thought she could guide and control Joffrey, and he just ignored her and did whatever cruel stuff he wanted to do. She also says, Content to hunt and study his histories. Which is a good point. Viserys always seemed more interested in building up his model of old Valyria, a dead kingdom, than he did in building up Westeros a current kingdom. Alicent tempts Renice by saying that her granddaughter could be made the heir of Driftmark like she wanted. If it's Driftmark you want, you should have it. For you and your granddaughters to pass on as you see fit. 
Now this would mean that at least Renice would be able to create a future where her granddaughters aren't denied power like she was. She also knows that these kids are her only remaining blood relatives. Alicent is trying to win her over because she's worried about her allegiance, and especially about her dragon, Melis, also known as the Red Queen. Dragons are like nuclear weapons in Westeros, and each side is going to try to secure as many dragons as they can. But Renice understands that Alicent is actually asking her to be a doormat for a man for her entire life. You desire not to be free, but to make a window in the wall of your prison. This is actually a neat visual callback to this shot from last episode, where a chair in the foreground makes it look like Alicent is behind bars, thanks to Think Story for that observation. Now, this conversation really gets to Alicent in ways that are going to pay off a bit later. So, Otto finally meets Masaria face to face. She's been secretly informing him for years. Remember, she was the one who spread word of Rhaenyra and Daemon's dalliances on the Street of Silk. Now, it turns out she's even more ambitious than we thought. She's basically kidnapped Aegon and is holding him hostage for a promise to end the boy fights. So, Missaria is very much like Varys from Classic Thrones, who is also known as the Spider or the Master of Whispers. Like her, he ran a spy network around King's Landing and had a soft spot for kids. Children are blameless. She leads the twins to find Aegon in the Great Sept. Now, this is not the Sept of Baelor, which we saw in Game of Thrones. Spoiler! This is the Great Sept that was replaced by the Sept of Baelor. Now, I thought about identifying all the statues of the gods in the room, but you know what? The Seven Gods are the only gods in Game of Thrones who never do any magic at all, so they're not real, and thus they are not worth naming. Aegon is really against the idea of being king, as he has been for the entire series. You can move to cut off any challenge to her succession. Then I won't. You are the challenge! Ah, the Targaryens. They either want the crown too much or too little. I don't want it. There's a scuffle and Alicent ends up with control over Aegon and she does not wait to lord this over her dad to try to prove to herself that she is actually the one who has power. Like I said, Renice really got to her. She calls her dad out for manipulating her. I see that now. Rather, I've been a piece that you moved about the board. Even though that's exactly what she's doing to her own son, Aegon. But Otto, like any parent, knows exactly how to cut her down to size. You look so much like your mother in certain lights. So what he's saying here is, you are like your mother, soft and weak, so don't try to play a man's game with me. And then we go to this creepy meeting between Laris and Alicent. Right away, we know something's up when Alicent starts to take off her shoes and stockings. And we see this close-up of the beetle on Laris's cane. Remember, we saw this same sigil on the prisoners that he hired to burn down Harrenhal, thereby killing his father and brother. And Helena is also knitting a beetle. Oh my god, I just figured out... Uh, oh, okay. Just thought of a huge spoiler from the book, so I can't actually say it. But damn, in like a year or so, there's going to be a heck of an Easter egg. And I'm telling you, that whole under the boards prophecy thing... Blood and cheese. It's a big deal, but don't look it up if you don't want spoilers. Laris has the title of Lord Confessor, basically the lead torturer. He wants Allison's go ahead to remove the rival spy network of Masaria, that's the White Worm. And to pay Laris back for his efforts, she displays her feet so he can. I love myself. Laris had more of a foot fetish than he would have directed Pulp Fiction. So I guess this is because his foot's disabled, but also it's like part of this weird puritanical sexual repression of this society. Basically, Allison has never been pleasured by a man, so she thinks this is how it's done. Or why does Laris want the white worm out of the way? Well, I think that Laris actually is the one who's running the boy fights, and he was using them to gain some kind of control or manipulation over powerful people like Prince Aegon. Now, since Missaria wants to end the boy fights, Laris wants her out of the picture. Meanwhile, Sir Eric rescues Renice and takes her through the secret passages past the skull of Balerion the Black Dread. Now, this was the dragon of Aegon the Conqueror and Viserys, and later Circe will do this to the skull. This skull has also been used for a lot of symbolic meeting. This is where Viserys told Rhaenyra about Aegon's prophecy, and just a couple episodes later, we saw a rat perched on this skull, symbolizing the eyes that watched her on the Street of Silk, and the eyes of the people who are eating away at the Targaryen dynasty. Or, you know what, maybe Laris is a warg, and he's inside of these rats watching everyone and munching on some tasty, tasty blood after the wedding. Nom, 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 nom. Then we see a hooded figure walking away from Missaria's burning home. And we get the point that Laris is behind this fire, but I doubt if Missaria is really dead. All the small folk of the city are being forced into the dragon pit for Aegon's coronation, and they're being driven forward like sheep. And this is underscored by showing us actual sheep. <laughs> Renice is worried about being pulled away from the king's way until she realizes that the crowd is taking her straight to her dragon, the Red Queen. 
At the coronation, we see this scroll, which is a prayer to the seven, which I'm not going to bother reading out because those gods aren't real. Alicent then shares a carriage with Aegon. Now, it's the same carriage that she shared with him years ago when he was a baby, back in episode two. In that scene, a young Rhaenyra was mad at her father because she assumed that her dad would love Aegon more because he was a boy. And now, here is Aegon all grown and assuming that his dad loved Rhaenyra more, and that is why she made him heir. But Alicent tries to control her son's emotions. She passes on Aegon's dagger, saying that Viserys wanted him to have it. And this is actually the moment when the Targaryen dynasty begins to fall apart. Aegon's dream showed him the Targaryen's destiny to destroy the ice zombies and end the long night. This dagger is a symbol of that secret passed down from king to heir. And now that chain is broken. Aegon does not know the history of this dagger or what a Targaryen king's true purpose is. All he knows is that he gets to have a pretty sweet dagger. Instead of using that dagger to protect the realm, he'll use it to kill his enemies. And we actually have a video coming out about this in just a couple days, so subscribe so you don't miss it. So as Alicent is trying to guide her son on how to rule, his only answer is, Dorsa, do you love me? And you can see the look on Allison's face. She's thinking, I've made a huge mistake. You imbecile. And then the crowds enter the dragon pit in all its glory, far from the ruins that we saw in season seven of Game of Thrones. Now, they chose the dragon pit because it's a symbol of Targaryen power and because it's the largest space in the city for holding a crowd. They want to make it look like the entirety of the small folk approve of Aegon's coronation. Now, Otto smiles like a sly child with a pocket full of dead bird. Much like Tywin Lannister, he is a hand to a kid who is also his grandfather, and he assumes that he'll be able to control his cruel grandson. Renice watching from the crowds is a bit like Arya Stark watching her dad's execution in another episode 9, this time of season 1 of the original Game of Thrones. Except, Renice's escape is a lot more empowering. So, then the crowning ceremony begins, where Aegon is given the crown of Aegon I, and they also give him Aegon's sword, Blackfire. That sword was also used by Maegor the Cruel, so they put it in sword storage until this ceremony. People really hated Maegor. So, Aegon II having the sword and crown of THE Aegon is meant to legitimize him in the eyes of the public, and I think it works. Just like in the book, Kristen Cole places the crown on Aegon's head. But there's a small difference from the book which claims that Septon Eustace blessed Aegon II because the High Septon was out in Old Town. Aegon is crowned King of the Andals, the First Men, and the Roinar. And actually, we don't hear much about the Roinar. They're a smaller ethnic group than the Andals and the First Men, and they settled in the Riverlands right here. Now, do you remember the dream that Viserys had about his son being crowned King? The dream it was clearer than a memory, and I placed our son up on the Iron Throne as the bells of the Grand Sept told, and all the dragons roared as one. All of that happens here. The bells even ring out in celebration of Aegon's coronation. Aegon the King! When Aegon gets applause, it transforms him. It's like Homelander at the end of season three. <laughs> This kid discovers that he digs the crowds and the praise. But then the beast under the floorboards rears its giant fire-breathing head as Renice ruins Aegon's coronation party. The crowd panics, but look how calm Kristen Cole is. Now I know these people see dragons a lot, but damn dude, my guy is Iceman. I am dangerous. Renice has them right where she wants them. She could end this entire war before it starts with a single Dracarys, but instead of blasting them, she pauses. Maybe it's because Alicent shields her son and Renice recognizes a mother's love. Or maybe she doesn't want to be a kinslayer, but I think it's more likely that she just hasn't chosen a side yet. So she flies away, probably to even fall to be with her dying husband. Now, like none of that happens in the book at all, but it's cool. And it sets us up for an even bigger showdown in the finale. Hey, did you ever find out who set up that fake Wi-Fi network? No, but if I ever do, I will kill the guy. It would be worth him doing it just so I could find him and kill him and kill his family because I want him dead. I want them all dead. All right, I gotta go. See you later. All right, man. See you later. Anyways, just remember, if you want to make sure your devices are protected and if you want to watch streaming sites from all over the world, click our link in the description to get a big discount on NordVPN's two-year plan plus four months for free. And that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.